Hello and praise the Lord, everybody. I'm Pastor Joshua Glick. And I'm Leah Glick. And we're part of the Journey Up Church. We're so excited to have each and every one of you join us here today for another edition of our cyber service. If you enjoyed today's service or if it ministered to you in any way, please feel free to like it, comment, reach out to us. Um, if you feel like someone else could use it, please feel free to share it. And more importantly, if you need a Bible study or would like to learn more about God, reach out to us. We would be more than happy to sit down with you and talk about God and, and just go on this journey with you. And for our Journey Up family, we now also have the ability to give online. And so to do that, you can go to our website at Our Journey Up. Dot org. We pray today that this message blesses you and go with God in Jesus' name. Well, hello and praise the Lord, everybody. I want to welcome each and every one of you all again to another cyber study here with the Journey Up Church. I'm Pastor Joshua Glick, and it's my pleasure to be with each and every one of you all this evening. And we're going to take a further look into the Word of God. We're uh, continuing our study with In Search for Truth 2, and we've just been having a great time uh, with, this lesson, with these lessons. Um, our prior lesson, we talked about repentance, and we went thoroughly over that process and what it consists of and, and how to repent and what that symbolizes and means in a child of God's life and how important it is for each and every one of us to have repentance, not just as a product of our uh, salvation of being born again, but also uh, learning an attitude of repentance in our lives to go to God consistently, daily if not even, to uh, uh, renew our commitments and our vows to God over and over and over again. So it was a, a very pivotal lesson, and if you missed that lesson, I would encourage you just to go back to it, uh, take a look at it just for a proper uh, understanding of repentance and what that means in an individual's life. Even if you've been in the church for, for a long time, it's good to refresh uh, those things uh, in Scripture just to remind us of the importance of um, the principle of repentance in our lives so that we can continue to renew our relationship with God over and over and over again. But we have another lesson to go over today, and this one is uh, exciting as well. And we're going to be going over the life uh, and early ministry of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. We're going to examine the birth of Christ, uh, His mission and preparation of the Son of God for ministry uh, that would reach towards a needy and even a skeptical world. And so we're going to uh, take a thorough review of that today. We do have a little bit of material to go over. So without further ado, why don't we just go ahead and pray this evening and ask for the presence of the Lord to be with us as we begin to uh, take a deeper look into the Word of God here tonight. God, we love you, Lord, and we thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, God, for your spirit, God, here today. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, continue, Lord, to be with us as we look deeper into your truth and we learn more of your word. I pray, God, your spirit will be with us, God, here tonight, Lord, and that you would be the teacher and you would speak to us, God, and, and open up, Lord, the uh, revelation into our hearts and our minds, God, in that the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, God, would continue to work in each and every one of our hearts. We love you, God. We praise you and we worship you, God, and we thank you so much, God, for this word. And I thank you, God, as well for each and every listener, each and every person that's going to take the time God, to be with us here tonight to learn more of the precious Word of God. I love you and I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and amen. Well, praise the Lord. We're going to get right into this lesson here tonight. That's in, uh, we are on, excuse me, lesson six, uh, chart four. This chart is titled, Jesus Christ, the Hope of of the world. And is anybody glad you know Jesus Christ and He is the hope of this world? Hallelujah. Now, six months after the announcement of John the Baptist's birth, the angel Gabriel was commissioned to deliver a similar message in Nazareth. And in this secluded village lived a young virgin by the name of Mary of the tribe of Judah. And she was espoused, or in other words, engaged to Joseph who was also of the house of David. 
And this quiet young girl was told that through the operation of the Holy Spirit that she would give birth to a son, and she must name the child Jesus, the name Jesus meaning Yahweh, the Savior. And Mary would be the highly honored mother of the soon coming Messiah. Startled by the amazing announcement, Mary was then encouraged with news that Elizabeth, her elderly cousin, was also expecting a child. And so quickly, Mary prepared to go and to visit Elizabeth in the Judean hills. And as the youthful relative arrived, Elizabeth, she greeted Mary as the mother of my Lord. And I can only imagine that that salutation fully confirmed the angel's words as they were given unto Mary. And as Elizabeth Elizabeth rejoiced, she felt the baby in her own womb also leap for joy at the announcement of the Messiah. Uh, Three months later, Mary returned to Nazareth. So imagine Joseph's confusion then uh, when informed that his wife-to-be was expecting a child. Espousal uh, among the Hebrews was much more binding than modern engagements. Uh, Because it was considered the, the beginning of marriage, espousal was legally binding, and it wasn't easily broken back in those days. So while Joseph struggled with this problem, an angel then appeared to him in a dream, revealing the truth of Mary's story. Her child was indeed conceived of God's divine spirit. Joseph was instructed to continue his marriage plans and name Mary's baby also Jesus. This was in Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. And her child would be a savior, not a savior from political bondage, but he was going to be a savior from sin which was man's most dreadful bondage. And centuries earlier, Isaiah had prophesied that the Messiah would be God manifested in the flesh. This was Isaiah 7 and 14. So Jesus would also be the God or the God-man promised to Adam and Eve at the dawn of history. Uh, Micah had also predicted that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem in Micah 5 and 2. However, it seemed inevitable that the child would be born in Nazareth, which was the home of Mary and Joseph. So with meticulous care, the Almighty God arranged for the birthplace to coincide precisely with Micah's prediction. The heathen emperor at Rome, his name was Caesar Augustus, He decreed that every subject of the Roman Empire must be taxed, and so all must register according to their family lineage. So every citizen, they had to endure the hardship of being enrolled to fulfill this prophecy by Micah. Joseph and Mary, they were then forced to travel from Nazareth to their ancestral home back to Bethlehem. And at the completion of the 100-mile trip, Mary sensed that it was time for the birth of her child to come. But they had had come too late. Every guest chamber was filled to capacity. There was no no place to reserve a house or a place um, uh, uh, to rest their heads for the evening. And so Earth's most important birth It should have been heralded from every shore. It should have been majestic. It should have been a place place where folks could come and worship uh, this soon coming king. But the precious Christ, he came not in fanfare, not in pomp, but he came secretly in a common stable among cattle. The first bed of the king of kings was in a manger or in a feed box for livestock. And as shepherds were tending their flocks nearby, angels appeared in the sky speaking of peace on earth and the birth of a Savior. Specific instructions were given, and the men hurried to Bethlehem where they found Mary and Joseph and the baby there lying in the manger. So lowly shepherds were the only worshipers to celebrate the greatest event of all of the ages. 
The shepherd's unusual account of a heavenly host became another important link in the wondrous chain of events that would crown the life of this child. How it must have greatly encouraged Mary and Joseph, I can only imagine, to see uh, uh, and to hear the angelic hosts and to, to see the, the, the soon coming onlookers to uh, be a witness to this great event. Most sheep used for the daily temple sacrifices grazed in Bethlehem pastures. Therefore, the shepherds who first heard news of the Savior's birth, we find this in Luke chapter 2, verses 17 through 18, where it says, "...made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds." Humble shepherds proved to be an effective herald in announcing the Messiah's coming to devout worshipers in the temple because they had the connections with the individuals coming back and forth through the temple because they serviced the sacrifice. Humble shepherds proved uh, that instance. You know, superstition has fixed the date of our Savior's birth to the date of December the 25th, at the day that we, of course, celebrate the birth of Christ. And this date first appeared in the 4th century. However, shepherds would have not, they wouldn't have tended their sheep uh, in open fields during the winter months. Jesus was probably born during the warmer spring or even possibly the summer months. Yet it's still good to observe this momentous occasion every day of the year. So why not? Why not uh, celebrate the birth of Christ on Christmas Day or on 25th of December? We have to pick a day, so why not celebrate it on Christmas Day? And having been born under the dispensation of the law, Jesus was also required to submit to prescribed customs and ordinances. On the eighth day, the Christ child was named, and then he was circumcised, which was the sign of becoming a covenant member. At the age of 40 days, Mary and Joseph presented their child to the Lord at the temple for the Jewish rite of purification. So Simeon, who was a just and a devout man, had been assured that he would not die until his eyes had seen the Lord's Christ. And when he beheld Mary beholding that baby, he was certain that the day for him had arrived. Taking Jesus into his arms, Simeon blessed God for being permitted to see his salvation, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of his people Israel in Luke chapter 2, verse 32. And yes, I said the Gentiles. Wise men from the east seem to have been the first to fulfill God's purpose for the Gentiles. To the Jews, God spoke through an angel. But to the Gentiles, God spoke through a star. Each was given in a language, perhaps, that was best understood for them in that time. Who were these wise men? Probably they were of the Magi, which were royal Persian scholars trained in astronomy and in wisdom of the ancient world. Um, Like the Jewish tribe of Levi, the Magi were entrusted with priestly functions as well. They were familiar with the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Redeemer, since Daniel was once prime minister of Persia under Darius and Cyrus. We find that in Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 and verse 28. In fact, the year of Christ's birth uh, could almost have been pinpointed from Daniel's prophecies alone. He had predicted that the Messiah would come into Jerusalem as a prince, 483 years after the Persian emperor Artaxerxes came and gave the decree for exiled Jews to rebuild their city and wall. Uh, This decree was given at about 446 B.C. So, of course, Messiah would be born more than 30 years before the coming to Jerusalem as a prince. And perhaps the wise men had also viewed with keen interest Balaam's prophecy stating that the Messiah's appearance would be signaled by a star out of Jacob. Find that in Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17. So more than three wise men were likely in in that caravan that found Christ. 
And when this large entourage suddenly appeared at Herod's palace, demanding to see that newborn king of the Jews, all Jerusalem then was disturbed. Many months had passed since the first appearance of that star, and the Persians assumed that such a notable child would surely be in the king's palace. So they first went to the king's palace to to find this child. And when Herod received this frightening announcement, he sent them to Bethlehem, instructing that they return and then report their visit or their findings back to Herod. And fearing for his own crown, Herod planned to destroy the child as soon as he was found. But God prevented Herod's evil plot by warning the wise men in a dream to return home a different direction, another way. So soon after the Magi departed, Joseph was also warned in a dream to flee into Egypt with the young child and his mother. And there they remained until after Herod's death. Now realizing that the wise men had deceived him, Herod became outraged. He became furious. Um, in, In a mad rage, he commissioned soldiers to kill all the males in Bethlehem under the age of two years old. To find the one child threatening his empire, the brutal king, that brutal monarch, killed them all. When Herod died, an angelic voice then instructed a sleeping Joseph to return to Israel with Jesus and Mary. After rising back to Nazareth, we're told of no more angelic announcements, no more prophetic words, and no more uh, nor worship from mysterious strangers or angels. But Jesus' boyhood was ordinary, and it went unnoticed, undocumented. Why are there no details given of the birth, or excuse me, given of the uh, 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 adolescence or of, of Christ's early years? Childhood records were not preserved, really, of any ancient hero. The important influence of childhood years upon the adult life is only a recent idea within our culture. But in ancient times, such details seemed irrelevant or insignificant. So there is no history of the childhood of Christ, nor of any Uh, historical figure within that time frame. So Jesus was a normal, healthy child, but he never once committed a sin. Nor did he perform any miracles in those early years. In fact, John describes his first miracle to be that of changing water into wine. We find that in John chapter 2, verse 11. Matthew tells us Jesus was the eldest in a family of at least seven children. That's Matthew chapter 13, verses 55 through 56. Being Mary's firstborn son, by common sense, indicated that there was probably some other siblings as well to follow along. In Nazareth, every Jewish boy attended a synagogue school. Uh, At the age of five or six, formal education would have begun. Bible study began with the books of the law, continuing to the writings of Uh, of the prophets. Moses' law was very demanding about religious education in the home. Parents were commanded to train their children about God and about His laws. This special mark of Judaism is one reason for the permanence of the Jews in history. All Jewish men were required to attend three great feasts at Jerusalem. They were required to attend the Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles. Women were allowed to go to those feasts as well, but they were not required to come. Although Jewish families had been scattered to distant lands, devout Jews faithfully attended these feasts. And at the age of 12, Jesus made his second visit to the temple. The first visit was his circumcision and dedication to God. And this time, he chose to come. Twelve-year-old boys were known as sons of the law, meaning that they were personally obligated to observe the ordinances that were performed during the Jewish feasts. After observing the feast, Mary and Joseph then started to head home. And instead of joining the pilgrims from his hometown, Jesus lingered at the temple, thoroughly uh, absorbing in the rabbis' teachings and, and also providing them answers. 
And after the day, after a day of travel, Mary and Joseph, that they missed Jesus and began to inquire of kinsmen and friends. No one had seen him. No one knew where he was. So they did what any uh, individual would have do. They started to backtrack. And quickly they returned to Jerusalem to continue their search. And after three days, they found Jesus there sitting at the temple, reasoning with the learned scholars. The group was absolutely astonished at Jesus' understanding and answers. Jesus' reply to Mary and Joseph was this. We find it in Luke chapter 2, verse 49. He says, How is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my Father's business? You see, Jesus was aware of his future destiny already at that age. Yet he obediently returned to Nazareth with his parents, and he was submissive to them. I want you to think about that just for a moment. <laughs> Jesus already knew. He already knew uh, uh, his purpose. He already knew his plan. And he, but yet he still was submissive to his mom and dad to leave him, to leave the, the temple, and to go back with his parents back to his home. What a lesson that is. Not only for young people of today, but what a lesson is, is that for us as well. Even though we may know the will of God in our life, even though we, we may feel a specific purpose or plan that God is developing for us in our lives, it's important, folks, I'm going to say it, it's important to still listen and submit to the man of God in your life. And he will lead you, and he will direct you, and he will shepherd you. Amen. And God will bless that principle in your life as well. Even though Jesus knew exactly that he was about his father's business, even though he knew he had a greater purpose, a greater plan than what his parents could ever even know, he was still submissive to him and went back home and obeyed him. From the age of 12, until the beginning of his ministry at the age of 30, nothing really is recorded in Jesus' life. However, from his uh, uh, later use of Old Testament scriptures, we are certain that he was thoroughly trained in the synagogue schools. No reproach could be found in his life, spiritually or physically. In this one verse of scripture, we discover four areas of development that was in the life of Jesus. It's found in Luke chapter 2 and verse 52 where it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. We know four areas just from that one scripture where he began to grow and excel in. Number one was wisdom. That's mental growth and acquired knowledge. He also he also grew in stature. That's physical growth, meaning he, be, he became strong and healthy. Uh, number three, we knew that he grew and, and had favor with God. That's, that means spiritual growth in his life, in preparation for his mission and as the Son of God, as a Savior of the world. And number four, he also grew in favor with man. That's social development and behavior. Jesus learned how to get along well with others and to be able to communicate effectively with them. I can only imagine, just by this one scripture alone, I can only imagine what a delightful individual, what a delightful personality Jesus must have had. Never was he happier in his later years than when he was surrounded by publicans and sinners or feeding famished crowds. Jesus was, I believe he was a great lover of both uh, uh, the things of God and a lover of mankind as well, as he loved being with and around people. Now, John the Baptist had begun preaching a message of repentance and baptism about six months before uh, Jesus entered into pu public ministry. Now, as John was baptizing in the Jordan River, Jesus came with others to be baptized. The legal age for a priest to begin officiating was the age of 30. And having reached that age now, Jesus was ready to begin his ministry. Although John did not immediately recognize his cousin, he felt the power of divine presence. And John's spirit witnessed that a, that a sinless, sacred person stood before him. But Jesus 
was waiting to be baptized. He was waiting to, to get down into those waters just like everybody else. The baptism of repentance was accompanied by confession of sin. But how could Jesus confess if he had no sin in his life? John instantly felt his own sense of unworthiness in the presence of the Savior. Since Jesus had greater authority from God, the roles of ministry, they really should have been reversed, shouldn't they? John needed the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but Jesus had no need for a baptism of repentance. And so after Jesus persuaded that this was God's plan, John reluctantly cooperated. So why was Jesus baptized? In Christ's answer back to John, we find both the reason why he declared baptism and the true significance of Christian baptism. As, as explained to John, he was baptized to fulfill or to complete all righteousness. This is found in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15. And here are some reasons for his baptism. Number one, that Jesus was our perfect example. Deliberately, Jesus established a pattern which he had intended all of his believing disciples to follow as well. 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 through 22 says, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Number two, you have to recognize that Jesus was also a part of the human race. Christ was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Baptism was not for deity because Jesus was both God and man, but it was for mankind. Therefore, we know that Jesus was man as well as God. Number, number three, the third reason was because Jesus was, all, he was our high priest. The high priest was always washed and anointed prior to serving. So at Jesus' baptism, he was washed and anointed with the Holy Spirit. And the next reason is that we know that Jesus was the spotless lamb of God. You know, sacrificial lambs were, were carefully inspected for blemishes or defects before being presented to the priest. And to be the spotless lamb of God, Jesus must also be washed and prepared, scrutinized and accepted for sacrifice by, by God, by the Heavenly Father. And also, he submitted, Jesus submitted to the initiating rite of the new covenant. You see, at birth, Jesus was circumcised. That was the initiating rite of the Abraham's covenant. And when he assumed public leadership, Christ introduced the initiating ordinance of the new covenant, an inner circumcision of the heart that was conducted through water baptism. After fulfilling all righteousness under the old covenant, Jesus gave his own body and blood to institute the new covenant. This is Isaiah 42 and 6. So after being immersed in water by John, Jesus went up straightway out of the water, and the most amazing thing was recorded in Scripture. The Bible says that the heavens opened up, and the Spirit of God descended upon Jesus bodily like a dove. The voice said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Ha! How John must have rejoiced at those assuring words. I can almost imagine it. This was the Christ. This was the Savior of the world. Jesus' baptism in water and anointing of the Holy Ghost is one of the few pivotal events in all of Bible history. His baptism introduced a new messianic age and prepared the way for the new covenant to be initiated for every single one of us in our lives. And so immediately after his baptism and anointing with the Spirit, Jesus retreated to the wilderness for a time of prayer and a time of fasting and a time of preparation for his upcoming ministry. Again, can I just add this? Being an example for us in our lives, we also, we got to pray, we got to fast, hallelujah, and prepare for the work and the ministry that God has placed inside of each and every one of our lives. So throughout those 40 days of prayer and fasting, Satan waited like a wild beast for the precise moment to pounce upon his prey. 
Christ's temptation was further preparation for the great work that he was about to begin. First, Satan appealed to the strong, natural appetite of the hunger that was within him for not eating for 40 days. He said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Yes, Christ, he could have used his supernatural power to feed the crowds and generate a massive following. But that was not God's plan. That was not his plan. His kingdom would be built by feeding hungry hearts <laughs> rather than satisfying the natural craving for food. Matthew chapter 4 and 4 it says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Since Jesus would not use his newly developed powers to satisfy the natural appetite, Satan res resorted to the other suggestions that challenged his position as the Messiah. Jesus was then taken to the pinnacle of the temple, and he was asked this in Matthew 4 and 6. He said, If thou be the Son of God, then cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. Now this brilliant idea might have might have appealed to the carnal mind, the carnal way of thinking. What a breathtaking beginning for his ministry that would have been. Leaping from a tremendous temple height to be uh, assembled worshipers below so everybody could have saw it, everybody could have witnessed it. Such a spectacular miracle. It would have accomplished the mission of Christ almost instantaneously. They would have automatically seen that he was something special. They would have automatically realized that, that, that there was something uh, uh, supernatural about uh, this person named Jesus. So what could he lose? God's word had already declared that angels would keep Christ from harm. So this would have been a simple method compared to the tedious instructions, compared to the slow changes that must be effected in man's thinking and the weary ministry actually chosen by Christ. Yet, he steadily refused to work a miracle for the sake of proving his power. Or in other words, let me put it like this, he refused to perform a miracle for the sake of helping himself. That's powerful. He said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That was the reply of Christ. We tempt God by placing ourselves in dangerous situations which God has never called us to. Christ's miracles were always performed to relieve distress or to increase faith amongst his followers. He would not display his power to satisfy the curiosity of Satan or the curiosity of Herod or the Pharisees. Christ's high and holy character never yielded to such base motives. They were never made to please the self, but they were made to touch others, to move upon others. The most difficult temptation was reserved for the very, very last. The pinnacle of the temple was not high enough. Jesus must then be taken to a, a lofty mountain for a broader view. All of the kingdoms of the world were viewed instantaneously as Satan offered this tempting bargain. He said in Matthew 4 and 9, he said, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Would Jesus selfishly seize power and glory by, by performing an unholy act of submission? The throne that he had come to claim could be attained so much simpler than the plan that he had been considering for the past 40 days. No self-denial would be needed. No self-sacrifice would be needed. No shedding of blood would have to be endured. It seems like a bargain. It seems like a bargain. It seems like a fast track to meet his goals and objectives. The carnal mind would eagerly welcome such, a, such an idea, such a proposition. And although Satan was indeed prince of the world, Christ had no intention of gaining worldly acceptance through a deceptive scheme. Again, Jesus defeated the enemy with God's word. He said in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10, he said, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. 
it would be impossible to improve on the Lord's method of dealing with the devil. Only the inspired word of God can expose and defeat Satan's lies. And this is an important lesson for each and every one of us here today in, 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 in our age and that we live. Only the word of God can, can defeat the, the deceptiveness of, and the temptations of the enemy. Note that Christ used the same weapons available to every believer today. Christ used the word of God to defeat the enemy. Scripture is much more useful it's much more useful in our lives uh, to defeat the enemy than just using it for comfort or just using it for devotion. Uh, but it is the most effective weapon in our hands against Satan's enticements and temptations. With each temptation, Christ began his rebuttal with this statement. He said, it is written. <laughs> it is written. Over and over, it is written, it is written, it is written. And we have to do the same in our lives today. Somebody help me. But how can we know what is written if we're not acquainted with our Bibles and its invaluable contents? How can we, how can we defeat the enemy if we don't know what's in the good book? And here, let me say this. This is the whole purpose of this whole Bible study. This is the whole reason why we are doing what we are doing, going through all these lessons, all of these weeks, uh, uh, recording it, uh, making it available to every individual, because I want you, I want those that are listening to this Bible study, I want you to know how you can defeat the enemy. I want you to know how you can overcome your personal temptation your personal bad habits, your personal uh, devils, if you will, the things that you wrestle with in between, in between your ears. How do you defeat those is by, by knowing the word of God, by, by proclaiming the word of God over that enemy. That's how you defeat the things that are going on in your life. By becoming acquainted with the Bible, your life will be, it'll be more rewarding, it'll be more fulfilling, and it will become victorious as you learn the Word of God. So having utterly failed, Satan was forced to flee in response to the Master's command. Get thee hence, Satan. Although conquered, he was not, he was not through with the conqueror. He departed just for a season. And then angels came and they ministered unto Jesus. Perhaps we don't always sense the presence of angelic forces in the midst of our temptations. We don't always uh, 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 have a sense that there are other things at play in the spirit world whenever we're confronted with temptations in our lives. But know that they are near, my friend. And the sooner that we resist the enemy, the sooner that we resist the devil, the sooner we can be encouraged and strengthened by God's helpers. Following his bout with temptation and with the tempter in the wilderness, Jesus returned, Scripture says in Luke 4 and 4, in the power of the Spirit to the place where John was baptizing. And one of John's great contributions was to direct two of his disciples to Jesus. Both were later chosen. As apostles, when Andrew and John heard of the coming Messiah, they wanted to meet and to follow him. So great was Christ's impression upon them that they became disciples for life. Quickly, they transferred allegiance from a closing ministry to a beginning ministry. Andrew also became the first soul winner. Ha, that's awesome. By bringing his brother, Simon Peter, to Jesus. Although Andrew never wrote an epistle, Andrew never founded a church. He opened a new career to one of the greatest apostles. And soon afterwards, Philip was brought within the circle of Christ's influence. Philip, in turn, found Nathaniel, or otherwise known, named uh, Bartholomew, a devout Jewish scholar who readily accepted Jesus as the Messiah. During his first year of ministry, these five men followed Christ while maintaining their own personal occupations. However, the day came when Christ asked for a deeper level of commitment in their lives. No longer would they be fishermen, but they would now become fishers of man. Simon, Peter, and Andrew, along with their fishing partners, James and John, forsook all to become official followers of Christ. Soon afterwards, Matthew, 
was asked to join the group in Matthew 9 and 9, Jesus saw something special in this despised tax collector. Being an eyewitness to the majority of events, Matthew's occupation of record keeping it provided the skills for becoming a narrator of the gospel that was bearing his name in, of course, in the book of Matthew. Jesus took about a year and a half to complete his choice of apostles. Most were with him for only about two years. The selection and training of men to whom his work would be entrusted was an extremely important part of Jesus' earthly ministry. I just want you to think about this for a moment. His entire cause, his entire mission was staked upon 12 men. Hmm. So many times in churches, we're all about the numbers, aren't we? We get so... uh, upset as pastors, as ministers. We need more people. We need bigger churches. We need to, uh, uh, we need to reach our community more. And those are good uh, motives and desires and sincere desires. And I, I don't uh, discredit any of those feelings. I think those are good achievements and goals to have, to always try to reach more into a lost world. But Jesus staked everything just on 12 people, 12 men. Jesus wrote no books. He had no elaborate church government. Jesus established no school of philosophy. Jesus organized no great armies to carry his banners. He merely gathered 12 men. Mostly they were outdoorsmen. They were men of the earth, farmers, fishermen, or or lowly government officials. None were of the nobility or aristocracy. In simple faith, they depended heavily upon him, upon Christ, for their own future. There was this inner circle, Peter, James, and John. They were known as the quiet workers. Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, Thomas, and Matthew. They were, they were uh, the little known uh, uh, James, the less, Thaddeus, or Jude, and Simeon, uh, excuse me, Simon. Finally, the, the final member, uh, Judas Iscariot, they, they completed the 12, the dozen assistants. And at first, the 12 were sent forth two by two. Now, in that way, they would be serviceable to one another. They would provide companionship for one another, encouragement and strength along their missionary journeys. Some apostles were not famous. Their actions, some, for some of them, their actions were never celebrated. But to each was given a very distinct and a very unique call, a commission and an obligation to become a fisher of men. And so it is in this world today, oh, there are far more than 12. Thank God for that. But each minister, each pastor is very unique in their own way, not only uh, unique in their uh, um, in their talents, in their giftings, uh, in their personalities. Not only are they unique in those manners, in their maybe their jobs. Some of them don't have are, are bivocational. Some of them are not bivocational. Not only are they unique in all of those areas, but they're also unique in their callings as well. Amen. And but that's but the same commission rests upon each and every one of them. Each and every one of them, in my eyes. It doesn't matter if they got a great name or if they're just somebody lowly working behind the scenes. All of them are men of God, and they are great in my eyes. Amen. And I pray that God would bless each and every one of them. And God would help me as a minister, a pastor, to to, to work with them and to uh, share the gospel as we all work together for God's kingdom. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to cap off this lesson tonight, but why don't we just pray here for a moment and pray that God's Spirit would work with each and every one of us as we all labor together for the kingdom of God. Lord, I love you tonight, and I thank you, God, for your grace, for your mercy, 
for your spirit. I thank you, Lord, for this precious word that gives us power over the hand of the enemy. And I pray, Lord, that you would begin to draw us closer as men and women of God to be able to labor together efficiently, effectively, God, each and every one of us with our own unique talents and giftings and abilities. God, help us, Lord, to to love one another, to serve one another, God, to, to be effective for you together in this kingdom. God, I pray, Lord, for unity. Oh, somebody help me pray this. God, we pray for unity, God, tonight. Unity, God, within our church bodies. Unity, God, within our ministry partners. Unity, God, as laborers together, Lord, for your work. Oh, hallelujah. My God, I pray, Lord, you would bind us all together. God, help us to have a love for one another. And if there be any division, any discord, God, any disunity among God, of the fellowship. God, I pray, Lord, you would remove those things and let there be a spirit of love and, and repentance and reconciliation and restitution. God, I pray, Lord, let your spirit, God, flow, God, through the brothers and sisters of Christ to work together, to love one another, to fulfill your calling for each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, praise God. Hallelujah. We are all going to the same place. Oh, we're all doing our best to make it towards heaven. And I pray I want to be a strength to you. I want to help you in any way I can. I want us all to make it together in Jesus' name. And I want to thank you for joining me on this journey tonight and uh, uh, learning a little bit more with me about the life in the time of Christ and, and just taking a, a, a gloss over uh, his ministry there in the New Testament. And I have enjoyed it, and I pray you've enjoyed it as well. I pray it's been a blessing to you. And so God be with each and every one of you this week. And always remember, if you serve a great God, be great to somebody around you this week. Lord be with you all in Jesus' name.